Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 35, reading to verse 40. Luke writes, when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let these men go. Those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told the words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. And so let me bring you to the events that we're looking at today. We know that Paul and Silas had been arrested. They were in a city called Philippi. And they had been arrested because they cast a demon out of a young girl. This young girl was a slave. She was a, uh, used by her masters as a fortune teller. And the scripture tells us that her owners had made a great sum of money with her fortune telling. So when Paul cast the demon out, her masters were infuriated. They saw that they lost their hope of profits when the demon had been kicked out. And they became furious. And they dragged Paul and they dragged Silas before the magistrates, before the judges. And they brought charges against Paul and Silas. And they founded their charges first on the fact that they were Jews. Now, at that time, the Jews were looked at as troublemakers, even opponents of Rome. So the charge they laid against them was really what we today would refer to as disturbing the peace. They said they were teaching customs that were unlawful to Romans. Now, as we saw, they didn't specify which customs, but... It could have centered on the message that they were proclaiming. You see, at that time, Rome had forbidden the introduction of new gods. And Paul had cast out the demon in the name of Jesus Christ. So, Paul had been preaching Christ and works were occurring through him in the name of Christ. And so, the name of Jesus would have given them a charge of preaching this new god. So without a trial, the magistrates acted on the allegations that had been made, and Paul and Silas, as we've seen, were stripped of their clothing. They were beaten with rods. They were then cast into a prison cell. They were fastened by their ankles to the stocks, and they lay on the cold, damp floor in a dark dungeon. The smell would have been putrid. The floor would have been cold and wet, and it was midnight. And they were in terrible pain, discomfort. And they were alone. And they showed us what happens when we go through our own times that we would refer to as our, our midnights, our hour, if you will, our, our midnight hour. Because it says in Acts 16, 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God. So they're in prison. They're in a dungeon. Their feet are fastened to a stock. They're on a cold, wet floor in a putrid, dark cell. But they begin to sing, and they sang and prayed loudly and joyfully, so much so that the, the other prisoners who were locked up heard them. They heard them as they were praying, and they heard them as they were singing, and, and they were listening to their prayers, and they heard them joyfully sing. And as they, as they did so, it impacted them. It impressed them. They were actually moved you see, there's something about people praying and singing that can be attractive to those who don't know the Lord. Why are you praying? Why are you seeking this one? Why are you singing to him with such joy and exuberance? Why do you do that? What is so attractive about this one whom you're singing to? Well, as they heard them praying, undoubtedly their prayers were something the others could hear. I don't know what they were praying, but and they were more than likely speaking to God about how good he is and what he does. And something began to move inside of the, the prisoners as they listened to Paul pray and Silas worship. In Psalm 108, verse 3, it reads, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. You see, this is Philippi. This is a, this is a uh, Gentile area. 
They're not in Israel here. They're, they're amongst the nations. And so the psalmist said, I'll praise you amongst the nations. In Psalm 104, verse 33, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And so that's what they're seeing. It's like the, the Bible became alive in front of them as they see these people who have been beaten and in, in great pain and discomfort in a smelly cell, and yet they're, they're praying to God and, and they're worshiping him and they're listening to him gladly. You see, how we respond in our own midnight hour can have a very impact, powerful impact on people. People can begin to say, where does this peace come from? Where does this joy come from? How do you survive these things? You lost your job or you're ill or you have a, a tragedy in the family. How is it that you're able to, to respond like that? What is it about you? When my father went home to be with the Lord and we're standing inside of the, inside of the, uh, the room there, just outside of the, uh, the room that my father passed away and that my father went to heaven. And, and, and the doctor comes in and makes the announcement and, and my wife, Marie, and I and our kids and, and all we... We stand up, and the first thing we did, my mom was there, and the first thing we did is we took hands and formed a prayer circle there in that waiting room and prayed to God. And, and later on when we came out, somebody approached me and said, I've got to ask, what are you? So we're believers in Jesus Christ. We're Christians. See, the world sees that kind of thing, and they wonder, why didn't you react in ang anger? Because so many people, when, when they lose something or they go through, the first thing they do is they begin to blame God, or they're angry at people, and they react with, with great screaming and angry. I've been there. I've seen that. When my, uh, my cousin Richie was, was 17 years old, he died of an overdose of heroin. He'd become a heroin addict at a very early age. And they found his body in a field, and he had been consumed by ants. And it was a closed casket service. I was 12 years old. And I went to the funeral, and my, my aunt, my Aunt Tilly, who later came to faith in Christ through, our, through my ministry, my aunt climbed on top of the casket next to the, the ground that it was to be dropped in and began to scream, and people had to remove her from that. I've, I've done funerals where people have been drunk, just kind of staggering around. They're so upset. And, and they look at us and they say, how do you handle that? How, how do you go through that where, where a lot of people would get upset and people would actually give them grace in that? They'd say, well, they just lost someone. And Paul's there and, and, and Silas is there and it's and they're on this cold floor, and it smells. It's dark, and they're singing, and they're praying, and people want to know what's going on, and we, we see that. How do you respond? Psalm 54, verse 4, surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. That's how we make it. And as that's taking place, we saw this. An earthquake hit. The prison doors had been opened. The chains of the prisoners had been loosed. They could have escaped. And the jailer thought they had. And he was about to kill himself. But Paul, Paul called out with a loud voice. And he said, don't harm yourself. We're here, all of us. You see, his evangelistic gift and his compassion provoked him to cry out to the jailer. Don't harm yourself. Don't harm yourself is the cry of a believer to someone who's unsaved. Do yourself no harm whether it's through a, a lack of hope or a lack of self-control. Do yourself no harm. That's why we'll say, do yourself no harm through your drinking and your drugging. Do yourself no harm. Do yourself no harm uh, through your fighting, your anger, your improper sexual relationships. Do yourself no harm. Do yourself no harm is what the believer will say to the world when we say, don't make these bad life choices. They're going to hurt you. You see, that's what we do. We cry out, do yourself no harm, even though people think that we're meddling in their personal life. What well, gives you the right to tell me what to do, they'll say. Who are you to tell me to do myself no harm? I'm not doing myself any harm, actually. I enjoy the way I am. But that's our message. We cry the same thing, even as Paul spoke to this jailer and said, do yourself no harm. We say the same thing. There's no reason to do yourself harm 
if you have a life that's been saved by Jesus Christ. And that's what's taking place. So he, he says, do yourself no harm. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. None of us took the opportunity to escape, including these other prisoners. Remember that when Peter had been released from jail by the angel that he had left for a home and the result were that the guards had been executed. But in this case, Paul told the jailer, do yourself no harm. It's logical to think that they had left, but none of the prisoners escaped. So he's saying that to him. He's saying, be at peace. You're not going to lose your life. Now the prisoners had been drawn by the prayers and the singing. They didn't leave. The deliverance of the girl, the message of salvation Paul had preached, though, was something the jailer more than likely would have been aware of, and, and it would have hit him. He was so shaken, we saw this last time, that he asked him, what must I do to be saved? You preach salvation. I've seen the way you live. I, I've experienced this earthquake. Obviously, you have something that I need. And that's when Paul said, to be saved is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you shall be safe. And as well as your household, you need to believe in Christ. And he, and he, he shared the gospel with him. And, and he and his family had been saved. And then as we saw last time, he, he gently cared for the men. He fed them. He, 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 he ministered with mercy to them. And then the family received baptism. And his life was forever changed. Because he heard and he had received the gospel. And so that's what's taking place up to this point. That brings us to our study so as this is happening, verse 35, when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. And so the magistrates are the judges, and they sent, notice it says the officers. The word officers, and in my Bible has it um, in, in, uh, in the verse, it says the lictors, the, the rod bearers, that's what they were. They were the ones who inflicted the beating on men, on the men. So these officers are being sent. Now, we aren't told why they decided to release Paul and Silas. It, it may be that they heard, it, uh, heard what had happened after the earthquake. They, they could have heard that the doors had been opened up and, and uh, none had escaped. And we need to remember they were superstitious men. And they're not willing to anger the gods. And these prisoners might be under supernatural protection. More than likely, they thought a night in jail and a beating, and they took a severe beating, would be sufficient. So by letting them go, he's also releasing them to continue what they did. There's, the charges were not uh, uh, followed through with, and so they're going to go back to what they were doing, which was preaching and all of that. So he's saying, go in peace, which would communicate his own well wishes towards them. And so they come and they tell that to them. Let those men go, verse 36. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have, have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Depart and go in peace. Go in peace reflects the jailer's thoughts concerning them. But Paul wouldn't do it. Paul wouldn't do it. Verse 37, Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now, do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. I like Paul. I really do. He's quite a man. Notice how it says, uncondemned Romans. Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And were exempt from that kind of treatment and punishment. There had been no trial. And they had been punished in public. And in doing so, actual Roman law had been violated. You see, the charge that was made against them was uh, that they are disturbing us by bringing in culture. They're disturbing our cultural norms. That's not a real charge. But what the Romans did to them, well, that is a crime. They had no trial. They were punished in public. The law had been broken. So you've done this in, in public. You did this openly, and, and now you want us to leave secretly? Verse 37 again, no, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. Now, an injustice has been done, and it shouldn't be covered up. 
What's happening here is this, very simply. We have been openly called into question. Our reputation has been tarnished. By putting us in prison and beating us, you impugned us as well as the message that we proclaim. And by treating us as criminals, you have called into question our character. Now, I want to develop this. I want to make application for a moment with you about this. You need to know this. We need to remember this. That one of the tactics that Satan uses is to undermine and attack our character. If our character is questionable, the message itself will be questionable. Why is that? Well, because we as Christians will tell people that we were sinners, God forgave us, we've been washed with the blood of Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, He's transformed the way we live, so we no longer do the things we once did, so we're not doing certain things anymore, and that develops credibility. People see us the way we are, and they'll say, something happened and you were changed. Something is different about these people. What is it? And, and so there's a credibility that the message has because we're saying that the message changes lives. And so the question has been for his character, but if they question his character because they beat him openly, they put him in prison, then it's going to undermine the power of the, of the, of the, uh, the uh, testimony. And so that's what happens. By treating us as criminals, you have called into question our character. Again, if your character is called into question, so is the message. That's something that happens in the ministry of Christ. We see it in Scripture. Remember this on one occasion. Remember how Jesus had cast a demon out and the religious opposition didn't question the exorcist. And what they did is they questioned him. In Matthew 9.34, it says the Pharisees said he cast out demons by the prince of demons. He would, they were questioning who Jesus was and the character of Christ by associating him with Beelzebub, with the devil. Well, it's by the power of the devil that he does this. They didn't question the work that he performed. They were questioning who he was. And by questioning who he is, they're questioning the message, the power that he has, the authority that he has, they're questioning its origin. And so they're saying, yeah, he may have cast out a demon, but he did it through the prince of demons. There's another question that was asked of him one other time that something was stated. They made it clear that they thought that Jesus was, was what once was called illegitimate. In John 8:41, and Jesus was speaking to them, uh, they said, his opponent said, we aren't illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself. Now, what are you saying when they say, we're not born of fornication? We're not illegitimate. What we're saying, what they were saying there, they were inferring that because Mary, his mother, had conceived of him prior to being justly married, that he was a child of fornication. That was a slam on who he is because they're saying that we have been legitimately born. My mom and my dad were married, and then we were born. But you weren't. Your mother was not. You weren't born legitimately. They're calling Jesus' birth into question and delegitimizing his message. There's another, another time that Jesus was eating a meal, and he was eating with unsaved people. Now, people would normally be judged by the company that they kept. Proverbs 12, 26 says it like this. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. And so my mom said, show me a man's friends and I'll show you the man. Who you associate with is normally, well, it's normally used as a, of a proof of the way you are. And so if you hang around with a bunch of angry people, they'll say, well, that guy's a gangster or just mean spirit or whatever. Well, all his friends fight. He probably does too. That's just, you know, if you're, you hang around with a bunch of drunks, they're going to say, yeah, that guy's he's a drunk too or whatever. It, you, the friends you have, it, it's, it's just show me a man's friends. I'll show you the man. So th that's called guilt by association. And so when they see Jesus there and, and he's eating with these people and all of that, uh, the question is asked when the scribes, according to Mark 2.16, when the scribes who were Pharisees saw Jesus eating with these people, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? He's obvious, obviously like that. You see, in their minds, sin was the common denominator with Jesus and these, these sinners. He fellowships with sinners. So he must also be one. 
Since he spends time with them, he must agree with their way of life. That means what he's saying is doubtful because he is not separate from them. And that's why Jesus made it clear. The reason I came, he said, is to seek and to save that which is lost. In Mark 2, 17, on hearing this, Jesus told them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, you can't get me to the doctor if I'm not sick. Marie's tried. My wife has tried. Ain't going. Ain't going. No. The ones who go to the doctor are the ones who are ill. And that's what Jesus is saying. I didn't call the righteous. I came to call the sinners to repentance. You can, you can think all you want of how good you think you are, but at least these people know what they are. And I've come to minister to those who have need. You, you're so self-righteous, he was saying to the Pharisees, well, you think you're well, but you're not. You're sick. These people, they're in need. These are the ones I came to seek and to save. These are the lost. He wasn't one of them. He was there to, to transform them by giving them a message. You see, and so what they do, and it still happens to this day, is people will look at who you hang around with, and they will question who you really are. Well, Paul does not want the gospel to be tainted in that way. And that's one of the reasons he didn't just leave the way that they asked him to. You see, if they could undermine his character, they could attack his credibility. And if they undermine his credibility, they will discredit his message. So he refuses to just leave and go on his way. Verse 37, no indeed, <clears throat> let them come themselves and get us out. When he says get us out, it's, uh, it means to escort us out. Listen, they beat us openly. They openly threw us into prison. And now they can humble themselves and personally escort us out of prison. We have been illegally imprisoned. Roman law has been violated. We have been unjustly beaten. And all of this is left in the mind of those who are aware of it that we're guilty. So in order to rectify this problem, judges, come and escort us out personally. By escorting us out of the prison openly, people will know that we are innocent. And that will clear us of any wrongdoing. Also, when the judges do this, it'll strengthen the faith of the new believers. It'll be an, an open acknowledgement of our innocence. We're Roman citizens. We've been unjustly jailed. We've been unjustly beaten. In doing this, you have violated Roman law. Now, there are times when we exercise our rights. And there are times when we need to make our voices heard. We don't do that to kind of, the old saying is to thumb your nose. We don't thumb our nose at authority. We don't do it to be regard, regarded as warriors against what we used to say in the older days. We weren't, we weren't uh, uh, you know, against the man, you know. We, and we're not doing it to be warriors against the devil so we can be seen by others. We don't do it that way. When we do stand up and say, no, I will not do that, it's to preserve our right as, uh, to live as free citizens in a free country. We do it to preserve the rights of other people too, especially believers. So whenever there's a time when you have to stand up against, uh, against the authority, you do it not because you want to be looked at as a hero. You do it because you're protecting other people. And that's what Paul's doing. Paul wasn't a, a petty man who felt his rights were violated. He did it to preserve his right to preach the gospel. You see, he and Silas were Roman citizens. They had a right to free speech. And the eternities of those he was ministering the gospel to was on the line. He wasn't simply fighting government. He was pursuing the right to preach, which he had the right to do. And it, it wasn't his reputation alone he was concerned about. It was that the gospel should continue going forth because it's the gospel that sets people free. In Acts 10.42, remember how Peter had said uh, that Jesus, he had commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. He's commanded us, so we ought to obey God rather than man. You want us to not talk in the name of Jesus, and we will speak in the name of Jesus, because you don't have the right to tell me I can't. And that's a free speech that we still have to this day. 
So when people tell the believer, you need to shut up, no, we don't. No, we speak freely because as, as far as I know it, the First Amendment is still in, in power and I still have the right to tell the truth in the name of Jesus Christ. And so to tell me not to speak in his name, you're violating my rights and I as a citizen and as a minister of the gospel have the freedom to proclaim that which I've been commanded to do. You see, and that's what Paul was doing. It wasn't that he was thumbing his nose. It wasn't that he's petty. It's not that he wants to fight. He doesn't want to look at, be looked at as some kind of warrior. He's just obeying God. And that's the best thing you can do is to obey the Lord. Well, as he's speaking in verse 38, the officers told the, these words to the magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. This deflates the judge's sense of self-importance and their power and their authority. If word got back to Rome, they would be in serious trouble. You see, the punishment appointed for those who transgressed the law was death and the confiscation of their property. So in doing this, Paul made it clear that these judges cannot overrule the law. This safeguarded the preaching of the gospel as well as safeguarding the believers. You see, remember, Paul is protecting the Philippian church that had just been born. In being mistreated and dealing with it, he, he made it safer for the members of the body of Christ there in Philippi. The gospel was that important. Its transmission had to be protected. And so in verse 39, they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and, and asked them to depart from the city. They pleaded. It, it, this was humiliating for these government officials but it had to be done. They stood to lose everything, even their lives, if they refused to. And so they pleaded with them. They escorted them out and requested that they leave. So they requested or they asked them to leave. Remember when Jesus ministered in the Gadarenes and how that there were two men of the Gadarenes. They had been in the tombs. They cut themselves with stones. They were screaming at night when travelers would pass by where they were at. They would come running out and scare them. And that Jesus went there and he cast the demon out, the demons out. Remember, they were called legion for there were many. And they ended up uh, going into the pigs and the pigs ran into, into the, the water and they drowned. They became deviled ham. You remember that when that happened? And that's where you get the Bay of Pigs. And that's how it happened. Remember how that this man, one of the men is spoken of as, as being at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. And then when Jesus was about to depart, he said, I want to go with you. And, and Jesus said to him, no, you go back and you tell your friends and family what great things God has done for you. But the others there who saw this happen asked him to depart from them. The world still does that. The world still does that. You can be in such hurt, in such pain, and you can be saved by God. You could have been, you could have been depressed, suicidal, and you get right with God, and, and you tell your friends, and they like you the way you used to be. They could put up with you as a... As a depressed person, at least we know what to expect when you come in the door. Or you may have been an alcoholic, somebody that ruined all of the family get-togethers. It's Thanksgiving, oh no, so-and-so is going to show up, and it's your turn to watch him, that kind of thing, because you know what he's going to do. Or you may be that angry person at the table that something is brought up, and before you know it, you, you would give your opinion and anybody who disagreed with you is just an idiot and you guys are all stupid. You, all of us have that in our family. Sometimes we become pastors. We all have that in our family. <laughs> and then you get saved. And they want you to depart. I could put up with you when you were angry. I could put up with you when you, de when you were depressed. I could put up with you when you, were, when you were an alcoholic. I could put up with you when you dropped those drugs, when you did drugs. I, I, I could put up with you because at least they knew what to expect. But now I don't. People will ask you to depart. They want you out. They want you gone. They don't want anything to do with you. And I'm not trying to teach 
you to, to be looking at people as, as, as if they're completely always against you. That's not necessarily true at all. But some of you understand what I mean. Some of you got saved, and the people you knew don't want anything to do with you. What they're saying is depart. And that's the worst thing you can do. You, you, you never, a person should never ask somebody who can do them good to leave them alone, but they do. But they do. They depart. They say, get out of here. And the people want the church today. Our nation is turned against the body of Christ in such an obvious way. And for somebody like me, it's, it's so transparent because I grew up in a different nation than I, have, than I live in now. And it's not some old man uh, up here just a nostalgic, sentimental guy. I'm not that. I just see it for what it is. I just see it for what it is. And the nation we live in right now is so corrupt and so evil, and, and yet we've got people who are saying it's not, but it is evil. It is wrong. There are so many things. I'm not going to get all weird on you about it, but it's true. And anybody who has eyes to see can see this. It's a different world that we're living in. And the church is being told to shut up. And so when COVID hits, and, and there's a lot of reports, I hope you guys are keeping up with these things, because if you're not, let me share a couple of things. There are reports coming out. Men like Fauci that everybody respected, right? Everybody, oh, he's the, you know, he said, I am science. I mean, that's who he is. He's science incarnate. And he's saying, I am science. Well, now he's saying, well, that six-foot rule that everybody was abiding by, we just made it up. There's no way, there was no scientific evidence that that was, we just, it just happened. He said that, this is almost a direct quote, he just said that. You got to get your boosters, you got to get these shots, they're going to keep you, oh, really? Did that really work? No, it didn't. Then what were you really doing? Controlling. We were controlling you. We're controlling you, and there are big pharma making billions of dollars from you, and we're getting this as constant, and believers are buying into it. We're buying it. I don't. I didn't get a shot. I didn't get a second. I'm not going to get one. I don't need one. I got COVID twice. I've got antibodies. <laughs> Super bodies. I do. I do. See, that's how God created us to fight these things. I have to be careful because I can talk a long time on this and I'm trying to do a Bible study. <laughs> Depart from us. You're getting in our way. Somebody wrote me a letter once and said, I can hardly wait till you're gone, your church is gone. Because your car is in our neighborhood bothering me. And so I wrote him back. He gave me his address, I'll write you back. And I said, you know, you want the church to leave. Have you ever thought that the fact that the church is here has actually stopped crime? That the people who go to church are not out there robbing banks or harming people, but are putting together families and raising them in the right way? Have you ever thought about that? That we actually are the salt and the light? And if the church was gone, that all hell would break loose, and you're saying that you can hardly wait until we're gone? And I said, let me tell you, that's gonna happen. Jesus is removing the church, and you'll get your wish. But until then, we're going to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That's what we do. That's what the church is here for. And see, so, but they say, we don't want you. We don't want you here. You are a minister of the gospel. And as you go forth, living your life, you're being watched, and you don't even know it. And no, I'm not preaching paranoia. You're being watched. People will see you, especially when you're serving in a capacity that somebody may notice. They'll see you, and you don't even know that. And they'll note the way you are and what you do, and they'll see you on the job site and, you know, in, in public somewhere at the supermarket. I run into people in the supermarket often who will walk up and say hello, and it's just great. We love it. And I put my stuff in their basket and then <laughs> take it out later. 
Just this last week, my wife and I were at a, a restaurant in the area, and we walked in, and there were quite a number of people who were wearing black. And so my wife said to me, probably a funeral. And I said, yeah, it's, yeah, I think so. And we went, we sat down, and they were in a banquet room. And I, I, we sat down, and, and then here comes a young man. He comes walking out, and uh, he's at, at the counter. And I'm not noticing him. I really didn't. I noticed him come and pay his bill or whatever. But then he, he walks up to me. I've never seen him before. He walks up to me. He says, excuse me, I don't want to disturb your, your meal. And I said, you're not, no. He says, are you? And he asked me, are you Pastor David? I said, yes, I am. He goes, I want you to know something. Well, actually, I said, is that a wedding? He said, no, it's a funeral. My grandfather, he said, died. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. This, this young man was 41 years old. He told me his age. He goes, my, my grandfather died. And I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. And he goes, yeah, he was a good man. He said, I didn't have a dad. I didn't have a dad. My grandfather raised me. I said, well, thank God for a good grandfather. This is what he said to me. He says, but I want you to know something. You have become a father to me. I am telling you, I am telling you, you don't know how you impact people. You don't know. how. I didn't, I've never seen this young man. He doesn't even go to our church. He watches me online. He says, that means everything to me. I want to be that man. I want to be an example. I, I, I want to have the younger men say, I, I would like an example of someone who loves his wife, loves his children, loves his grandchildren one day. I want that example. You can be the same thing. You are the same thing. If you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, there are people who look to you in that way. And that's why Paul didn't want to be associated with something that is wrong, that would keep his ministry from flourishing, and yet the world still says, depart from me. I don't want anything to do with you. Get out of here. And that's what they're doing to them. They're saying, leave. Well, in verse 40, they went out uh, of the prison and entered the house of Lydia and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. And so they said, leave. And, and they did. They, they, cleared, they were cleared of the charges. They were declared innocent. And they went to Lydia's house. Now remember, Lydia's house had been made available for Paul and his team to stay there. And it became a meeting place for the early church, the church of Philippi. The Philippian church became very precious to Paul, and the Philippian church loved him deeply. They were thankful because he had introduced them to God through Jesus Christ, and they supported him. Later on, he writes a book, a book to them, the letter to the Philippians, and in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, he says, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. In 2 Corinthians eleven nine, 9, he said, When I was with you and needed something, I wasn't a burden to anyone. For the brothers who, who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. The Philippian church was very precious. Well, they loved him very much. And so in verse 40, they saw the brethren and they encouraged them. You see, they'd been concerned, but, but God had a plan to reach a jailer and his family. And it, it, initially it looked bad, but God had turned the evil around for good and noticed that they, they strengthened them, they comforted them. What did they do? Well, they told them what God had done. And again, his loving concern for the believer is revealed. Remember how Paul had exhorted the churches in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch? He had been mistreated terribly he was stoned by a mob. He was left for dead, but he rose up and went into the city of Derby and he preached there. It says in Acts 14, 22 and 23, when they had preached the gospel to that city and, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Paul didn't teach and nor did he live a life of cheap grace. Now that I'm saved, I can continue to do whatever I want and go to heaven. He didn't live that way. 
He knew that trials and persecutions were part of the life of a believer. Remember Jesus in Luke 9.23 had said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Paul was Jesus' disciple. He had this inner drive, a motivation to follow him. He knew that the life would not be easy. It certainly wouldn't be painless. It wasn't a self-seeking life, a self-pleasing life. It was a life that was filled with affliction, with difficulty. It seems to me that this element, by the way, of the gospel sometimes is lacking in the preaching. The Christian life isn't a painless life. He knew he was to deny himself, to seek God's will in everything. He knew that carrying a cross was going on a death march. And he made the decision to follow Christ at the end, and it was worth it. Later on, he would tell the Philippians in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He had an eternal framework is what it was. Paul was capable of seeing beyond. He knew. Jim Elliott once said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And it was from that perspective that, that Paul would encourage believers. He was still in pain. He had taken a severe beating. He had been on a floor that was filthy and cold in the dark. He's still in pain, and he's bruised, and he's battered, but he had the credibility that was needed to encourage a church. He wants them to keep their eyes on the one who suffered on their behalf because he saw them as more than just people that he spoke to. He saw them at his as what has been called his forever family. In Philippians 4.1, he said to him, my brothers whom I love and I long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So what he went through, he knew could be used to encourage others. And he revealed what the response to this kind of treatment is, is to be. In 1 Thessalonians, he said it like this in chapter 2, verse 2, he said, after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. They could not shut us up. Why? We were commanded by God to speak the truth. That's what you've been commanded to do, by the way. Instead of saying, there he is, God, send him. It's a good thing for us to say, here am I, Lord. Send me. I'll be used for you. There's nothing I can ever give up that is more than what I've gained by being in him. All of my blessings. Sometimes when I hear the songs, and I'll close with this, when I hear the songs of how good God has been to us, I, I can't help but tear up a bit because I think about that. My wife and I think about that together. Look what God has done in our lives. Look how good he has been to us. He gave us beautiful grandchildren. We had to have kids first, but he gave us beautiful... <laughs> <laughs> he has been so good. Why would I deny the one who has loved me? Why would I shut up? You know, Christian, encourage your brothers and your sisters, and may I encourage you, be open about your faith. I do believe that we're in the last days, but I also believe, I really am growing even more so now, to believe that there's a younger generation that is just looking for someone to tell them the truth. I really believe that. I talk to young people. Tell me the truth. There's so many lies out there. Can somebody... But please live the truth be tr before you try and give me that truth. Because I see through hypocrisy. That was me as a young man. When somebody said to me, you shouldn't, drink, you shouldn't smoke pot, I'd look at them and say, then you drink. It's just a different way of going to the same direction. Except when you drink, you want to fight. When I, when I smoke dope, I want a Twinkie. I mean, but... <laughs> It's your, it's your way of coping. I don't need dope. I needed the Spirit. 
and others do too. We all do. This world needs Jesus. Let's not close our mouths. Let's speak in his name.